This episode is brought to you by the American Homebrewers Association, who invites you to attend HomebrewCon this June 27th through June 29th in Providence, Rhode Island. HomebrewCon brings 3,000 homebrewers together for three days of brewing seminars, nighttime events, and camaraderie. HomebrewCon is also the leading showcase of brewing supplies and equipment. Visit homebrewcon.org to learn more. That's homebrewcon.org. Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, January 24th, 2019. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. This week, Steve Wilkes of stevesbrewshop.com and I taste round seven of the Hop Sampler series. This time, it's old standby Willamette against Amarillo and Falconer's Flight. If you go to basicbrewing.com, you can find archives of our audio and video shows, our DVDs, our brewer's logbooks, and other basic brewing gear, including our tie-dye silicone pint and our basic brewing brewing rainbow shirt. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Basic Brewing and find our show page on Facebook as well. We have a cool Basic Brewing app on iTunes and Amazon.com, and we're found all over the place where fine podcasts are served up. If you'd do us the favor of rating us on iTunes and leaving a nice comment, they say that new help, uh, new helping listener find us do. <laughs> If you want more honey, need more coffee. If you want to support us financially, check out patreon.com slash basic brewing. Thanks to everybody who's helping out in that way. If you go to patreon.com slash basic brewing, you'd see a long list of stuff that you can access if you sign up as a supporter. This is a milestone week for uh, the home brewing world and the craft beer world, well, just the beer world in general. Um, because Wednesday, January 23rd, is, it's the day I'm recording this, it's the last day that Charlie Papazian uh, is an employee of the Brewers Association. And as you most likely know, and what rock have you been hiding under if you don't, Charlie founded the American Home Brewers Association back in the 70s and then was the head of the Brewers Association. And those two organizations were at the forefront of the growth of our hobby and of the craft beer movement across the globe. Uh, it's just I, I would I would hesitate to think where we would be without the AHA and the BA. Uh, today, the AHA has 46,000 members, and the Brewers Association has almost 5,000 member breweries. Just incredible. A, a few weeks ago, uh, you heard Gary Glass, director of the AHA, talk on this show about the contributions that Charlie has made to beer and that he will be missed in the day-to-day -day operations uh, of the organizations. But I'm sure that we'll still be seeing Charlie and benefiting from his knowledge and experience. So good luck to Charlie Papazian on the uh, next chapter of his journey. And uh, may he be able to relax, don't worry, and have a homebrew in good health and happiness for many years to come. And thanks thanks for everything, Charlie. Uh, and if you go to homebrewersassociation.org, you can see a collection of 10 of Charlie's homebrew recipes, including Rocky Raccoon's Honey Lager, Dusty Mud Irish Stout, and Castle Boucher Mead. Mmm, very cool. Also news from the AHA, the National Homebrew Competition Open Enrollment is happening now. Uh, enrollment ends on January 29th. So you don't have to ship your beers until March, but you do have to enroll now to reserve your spots. So go to homebrewersassociation.org for more details and good luck with that. Our sponsor, Imperial Organic Yeast has a message for you pro brewers out there. I know you're listening. Planning brew schedules just got easier. Starting now, commercial orders of up to 20 liters of A38 Juice, A07 Flagship, and L13 Global are guaranteed in stock and ready to ship in 24 hours, or shipping is free. And uh, note that Imperial will continue to ship Monday through Thursday. So if you already you already know that Imperial provides professional and homebrewers the highest sell counts in the industry with excellent uh, customer service and top-notch customer support, well, now Imperial is helping the pros be a bit more nimble on scheduling brews. 
And there's something new coming out from Imperial as well. B53 Precious is the new seasonal strain from Imperial that's available through February. So listen to the the description. Where would your Trappist IPA be without this strain? A low phenolic profile, along with clean, bright esters, make this a great strain for a hoppy Belgian-style ale. Use Precious in primary and then add some W15 Suburban Brett in secondary or in bottles to provide a crisp, complex, dry, and wild Belgian-style beer that will morph into a new creature over months of conditioning. Hmm. It sounds sounds delicious. It sounds a lot like Orval, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, maybe my next brew. You know I love Imperial Organic Yeast. My stir plate is dusty now because I don't make starters for moderate gravity beers anymore. Uh, homebrewers, ask your local homebrew shop about Imperial. And pro brewers, head over to imperialyeast.com to find out more about quick order fulfillment of juice, flagship, and globe. Imperialyeast.com. Let's take a look into the mailbag. Martin writes, longtime listener and fan from Seoul here. Thanks, Martin. Uh, from watching your videos and listening to the podcast, we seem to share both the appreciation for good beer and a level of caution that comes with drinking. Ever since the session beer episode, my homebrews have all been at the 2.5 to 3.5 ABV level. Wow. With the tips and know-how you've shared, I've reduced the alcohol content and calories without sacrificing what makes good beer awesome. Oh, that's that's good to hear, Martin. In the same vein, I'd like to continue improving my beer in terms of healthiness, and since homebrewing is all about the customization, this might be the perfect experiment for basic brewing to take on. You see, I just came back from the doctor and was told I have very high levels of purine and that beer was a major source of purines. A high level of purines is apparently highly correlated with gout. Martin says, while I reduce my alcohol intake, I would still like to learn about how to reduce purines in a beer without compromising flavor and quality. What methods can I employ to reduce purine in beer? Thanks for the note, Martin. I'm glad you're you're looking after your health. I'm, I'm trying to do that here in two, 2019. Um, a good friend of mine is struggling with gout, and it's definitely something that you want to avoid. He's not a beer drinker, so that's not where his trouble is uh, coming from, though. I did some extensive research. In other words, I, I, ch I checked Google, and it, it looks like many uh, blame yeast for the purine in beer. You know, some say yeast has some beneficial qualities like uh, vitamin B and such as that, but uh, for those susceptible to gout, it sounds like yeast carries some risk as well. So keep, keep in mind, I'm not an expert in this area or any other area for that matter. <laughs> So one thing you may want to look at, Martin, are ways to eliminate or limit yeast in your finished product. And one way is to use finings to settle the yeast out, but that may not be as effective as you want if you want to get it out altogether. But uh, nowadays, there is equipment that will allow you to filter beer at a homebrew level. Uh, and if you use a filter that is tight enough, you can take the yeast right out. Uh, there is some discussion that uh, filtering affects beer flavor, but, uh, man, if you have health concerns, uh, that may be a minor factor. So, coincidentally, the guys over at the Brewlosophy podcast posted an episode this week on beer filtering. Uh, and it's something we've covered here on this podcast in the past, but I'm sure there's more gear uh, that's come out there uh, since we've talked about it. So, check out the Brewlosophy podcast on filtering. And I hope that helps, Martin. And thanks for listening all the way over in Seoul. Here's a short note from Scott in Franklinville, New Jersey, who says this may not be safe for this podcast, but I, I couldn't resist reading it. <laughs> it's not too bad. Uh, you may remember in the Monster Cereal show, I said that there is a version of the cereal, the Monster Cereals, called Yummy Mummy, uh, which apparently means something else in Australia and other places. Uh, Scott asks, what kind of beer would you make with Yummy Mummy cereal? The answer is a MILF stout. There you go. That's <laughs> from the I wish I had thought about it at the time 
uh, department. On another note, <laughs> let's talk about our sponsors, Desiree and Dave from High Gravity in Tulsa. I hope Desiree won't mind following that joke. <laughs> There's there's one thing that isn't a joke, and that's serious savings on a single-vessel high-gravity Warthog electric brewing system. Listen up, because this is the last time that you'll hear about this. The uh, single-vessel electric systems at highgravitybrew.com have been on sale for uh, $200 off for a while now. Well, at the end of January, that sale ends. So if you've been on the fence about jumping into electric brewing with a system like mine or Steve's, now is the time to make the leap and save a couple hundred bucks. You know I love my Warthog system. Hitting strike temperatures and maintaining rock-steady mash rests is super easy, and controlling the boil, even in cold and windy conditions, is no effort at all. Electric brewing takes the pain out of propane, and with my system from high gravity, I never have to worry about the wind stealing my heat. Uh, and if your and if your taste goes beyond a single vessel system, High Gravity has two and three vessel electric systems from five gallons up to two barrels, and they use a two vessel Warthog system, uh, one barrel system to uh, brew for their Pippin's tap room. So that you know these are real world tested uh, systems. So and you can check them all out uh, at HighGravityBrew.com, and if you buy a a uh, single vessel system uh, before the end of January you're going to save a couple hundred bucks before you know before we head into February and use the code EBC75BB to save an additional 75 you can't beat it check it all out at highgravitybrew.com okay let's go to Steve's house to taste hop sampler number 7 Steve Wilkes, welcome back to Basic Brewing Radio. Thanks, James. It's a pleasure to be back. Here we are at your house, whatever studio this is. <laughs> <laughs> what is it, nine and three quarters? <laughs> I think. You have to run at the wall really hard to get in. <laughs> well, we are, this is a lucky number, hop sampler number seven uh, already. It's hard to believe. No kidding. That means we've gone, this is our 21st hop. Yes. So yeah, yeah, that's right. We will be, we will have tasted twenty-one hops by the end of this. So we need to, we need to put up a little thingy somewhere to, yeah. to like a chart of what we, what we tasted and what we thought and and all that somewhere, maybe oh, a Lord. page or something. Yeah, somebody will have to do that. <laughs> Won't be me. <laughs> uh, so today we are tasting Willamette, not Willamette. Uh, and Amarillo and Falconer's Flight. And uh, to remind people what uh, what we've got here is we've got three bottles in front of us, three beers, and they're randomized, and we don't know what they are. Mm -hmm. uh, we've labeled them one, two, and three. Uh, these are three one-gallon batches of beer or three six-packs of beer that I made with extract. And here's the way it goes. I started with three quarts of filtered water in the pan. I warmed it up a little bit to be able to uh, to dissolve the extract in it. And I used one pound or 450 grams of Pilsen Light uh, dry malt extract. Mixed that in there. And my son Drew helped me uh, with these batches. We brought it up just to the boil. So about 208, 209 degrees Fahrenheit. You know, about 100 C. Uh, and then just as it was starting to get agitated and bubble, we shut the heat off, put in the amount of hop for that particular batch, stirred it up, set it aside for 30 minutes. After the 30 minutes, cooled it in an ice bath, uh, put it into a one-gallon jug fermenter, which had been sanitized, of course, and then added three grams of US 05 yeast, and then bottled in in uh, bottles and put one uh, carb drop in each bottle to carbonate. And uh, I came up, last time we got together and talked about uh, this hop stuff, I came up with the theory of hop stand bittering units, or HSBUs. And the way you figure out an H HSBU is you multiply <clears throat> the alpha acid percentage 
times the how many ounces that you're using, and then you multiply. Then uh, you take the product of that, divide that by the volume. So in this particular uh, set, the 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 HSBU is around uh, five point five home or hop stand bittering units. So we have uh, uh, 28 grams of Willamette, which is a full ounce of Willamette, and it was at 4.2% alpha acid, so pretty low. Mm -hmm. 15 grams of Amarillo, which is at 7.7% alpha acid, and then 11 grams of Falconer's Flight, which is at 11.0% alpha acid percent alpha acid so does, does all of that make sense yes so in other words we used a a full ounce of willamette just a little over half an ounce of amarillo and a bit less of uh almost a third or a little over a third of an ounce of falconer's flight in each of these one gallons the the original gravity is around 1060 the finishing gravity is around 1010 for an abv of six percent is there anything that i've forgotten <laughs> in the boilerplate no i don't think so um you know this is the second time i've heard it but meaning you know the last episode we did and now i've heard the description again and i i think it's just brilliant um and just to make sure you know you know one of the questions that was running through my mind so to make sure that folks understand the reason you can't use the regular say tens, tens of scale or any of the other IBU scales is because we're dealing with a hop stand. So we don't have the boil time as a predictor mm -hmm. of extraction. So you've come up with a way to uh, predict the, the the hoppiness or the bitterness, I should say, of the beer. But it does depend on your particular brewing mm -hmm. style. Um, so if I do a hop stand at 45 minutes, my... I can't say hop stand bittering unit yeah. will be different than your hop stand yeah. bittering unit at say 15 minutes or 30 minutes or whatever. Yeah. So you have to be consistent across your, your batches. You have to pick a time length yeah. and a temperature to hold it at, I think. Right. Right. This is a device in order to do some benchmarking. Right. Like for instance, I don't have my logbook with me. I just, I had my wife take a picture of the, <laughs> of the page with the hops on the, <clears throat> pardon me with the information about the hops, and I've got it on my phone here. But I think the last batch was like six and a half HSBUs or something like that. So, you know, we don't have those side by side, although I could have brought uh, one of those to compare. But this, yeah, it's just benchmarking from batch to batch, right. you know, within a within a, a home brewer's own brewing batches. So, you know, even if you did the same amount of, a, of time for a hop stand, Maybe you did it a 10-gallon batch instead of a one-gallon batch. You know, right. it's, it's going to the, the temperature fluctuation is going to be different. Right. It's going to be different depending on you know the ambient temperature of your room, uh, or whether you're doing it outside or inside, or you know, it's there are lots of variables in there. It's not like an IBU that can be tested in a lab and saying this is what an IBU is. Right. That's what I wanted to kind of uh, touch on, which you just did perfectly. And then also, though, for the for our purposes, or for comparison purposes, it gives you a way to level the bitterness playing field, regardless mm -hmm. of what the bitterness level is, so that we can get we can allow the flavor of the hop to shine without being influenced or unduly influenced by the amount of bitterness present in the beer or not present. Right. Okay. Yeah. In the beginning, we start when we started this, we just did hops that were similar. Uh, alpha acid levels, mm -hmm. and we just and I just used the same amount of each of those. Well, you know, last time the Chase's Choice episode, your son Chase picked out the three different hops, uh, and they were of differing alpha acid levels. So that didn't seem fair to me to add like all one half an ounce or add one an ounce. So that's when I I right. used math to come up with with uh, evening out those alpha acid levels, right. you know, so that hopefully we'll get, you know, uh, comparable bitterness levels between the three. And we've been tasting on these. And so what's your op opinion on the, uh, on that? Are these three similar in their, in their bitterness levels or their hop punch levels? 
Yes, they very much are. I'm very struck at how similar they are. Um, and knowing a little bit about each one of these hops, having used all of them quite a bit, actually, for once. So we've, we've hit a, a trifecta that, you know, I've used these hops quite a bit. Um, I'm really, really struck at how similar the bittering levels are. And then by extension, I'm really struck at how similar the flavors are. Mm-hmm. I'm really surprised at that. And uh, not to mean that their carbon copies are definitely different from one another, but wow, they're they're just extremely similar beers. Yeah. If uh, for those of you who have seen the uh, video episode that my son Drew and I shot at the house, uh, we tasted these beers, and the Amarillo one was had a much stronger flavor, not necessarily a stronger bitterness, but a stronger flavor to both of us. It really stood out as like, wow, that's a lot of grapefruit, you know, and it was just really citrusy and just really had a ton of flavor compared to the other two. The other two had different flavors, but they were similar in the amount of hop flavor that that we got. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that apparently has has tamed down a bit because they're each, I was expecting to have an advantage because I was going to be like, oh, the one that tastes most like hops is going to be the Amarillo, Mm -hmm. but that's calmed down a lot. And these three are very similar beers. Uh, They're all three very tasty. Uh, And I have to say that as a New Year's resolution, I've cut way down on my my beer consumption. This is, these are the first beers I've had in like nine days. So they're tasting really good. (laughs) 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 <laughs> but they they uh the, they really taste good uh uh and they did before but they're just like super super juicy and and delicious these three beers yeah how long have they been in the bottle uh i don't or less. <laughs> i don't have a facsimile in my, lo- in my logbook here uh three weeks maybe i don't know not that long it's, yeah it's gonna say not not very long it couldn't have been very long so they're really fresh beers right um but i i would say that they they are calm. I mean, they 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 are finished beers. I don't know, right, I don't know right. how else to say that. They yeah, they're not green. They don't taste green or like we've rushed it to you know get a show on or something like that. They really are finished beers. Uh, shall we shall we explore the first one? Yeah, let's talk about the about beer number beer number one. Hmm. Oh my goodness. That's got a ton of, it's got a ton of grapefruit mm-hmm. and a ton of uh, like uh, tangerine. I taste there's, it's juicy and and um, citrusy and just like just like a fruit salad of citrus, you know, all together. Yeah, all that. It's like a, it's like a taste of honey. <laughs> <laughs> Much sweeter than wine. Much sweeter than wine. <laughs> um, no, it it. It, it, I was really struck by the uh, grapefruitiness of the when I just took a sip a moment ago, and then by the more complex citrus flavors that are coming through. So I didn't think of tangerine, but I did think of kind of like it's that's more than just a one note, you know, Johnny. There, it's it's more than just grapefruit. There's a lot of other flavors going on. Um, so pretty complicated. I. It is a little, um, well, floral maybe. I don't know. It, you know, it, it it doesn't. It's just so. It's just so interesting, and I don't know. Of course, I'm trying not to look at the descriptions, but um, but I, I actually do get kind of a honey note out of the mm. beer. Now I realize that hops don't put honey notes in beers, but. But as opposed to the other two, there's something about the hop that's kind of allowing some flavor to come through to me that makes this beer really, really nice and desirable. I really mm-hmm. like it a lot. Yeah, it's really good. Uh, so should we read a, des- a description from sure. for, that we've borrowed these from hopslist.com? Uh, so all credit for these descriptors go to hopslist.com. And I hope they don't mind us doing this but you know we're giving their side a plug for free so well, sure <laughs> and they're, they're a lot easier to read than hop hops lisp dot com it's, <laughs> it's a lot trickier <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so i just gonna go ahead so falconry flight <laughs> hello meg hello meg would you like some falconry flight <laughs> that's right 
Uh, we'll return to hoplist.com. Uh, and we'll read. Uh, this is Willamette. So here's the official description from hoplist.com. Considered a pillar of the U.S. hops industry. I thought I was a pillar of the U.S. hops industry. <laughs> More like a wooden dowel. Anyway. <laughs> Considered a <laughs> better than Roddy McDowell. Right? That's right. <laughs> Considered a pillar of the U.S. hops industry, Willamette is one of the most prolifically grown varieties in the U.S. First selected in Oregon in 1967. Wow, it's USA. It's it received USDA ascension. <laughs> what? I am having a senior moment. Yeah, a session. A session. A session. I don't know that word. Accept it. Well, it was accepted by the USDA. How about okay, that? we'll go with that. <laughs> wow, I have a degree in journalism. Uh, well, it was accepted by the USDA in 1971 and was, was released the same year. Hmm. Well, Lambert is a triploid aroma hop with its heritage being primarily derived from the English variety Fuggle and Fuggle Tetraploid. Another word. It shares the same pedigree with its sister selection, Columbia. When brewed, Willamette features complex spiciness characterized by both herbal, floral, and fruity notes. Originally bred to replace Fuggle, it has excelled in popularity in recent times, particularly among craft brewers, and accounts for approximately 20% of all commercially grown hops in the U.S. today. Hmm. Or by USA Today. <laughs> <laughs> um, wow. Her- herbal, know- herbal, floral, and... Herbal, floral, and fruity. Oh. I love that band. <laughs> They're good. Herbal, floral, and fruity. and fruity. Now, the only problem, of course, is that I kind of think all of these are herbal, floral, and fruity. <laughs> yeah. I Really, I yeah. do. Yeah. So that makes it tough. Well, they're warming up, which which uh, makes it a little easier to, to taste uh, flavor differences. Now, in <clears throat> when Drew and I uh, tasted these on the video show, I thought that Willamette had more of kind of a it was citrusy, but it had more of a kind of an old world hop flavor, mm. kind of an herbal, spicy flavor. I'm not necessarily picking that up yet, although we're going down the line here. Uh, so, hmm, interesting. So, shall we taste hop or beer number two? Beer number two. Beer number two. That is less uh, citrus fruit salady to me. Mm hmm. To me, it's a little more grassy and maybe a teeny bit more oniony. Yeah, I, yeah, all, almost to savory. So mm-hmm. I'm going to go with herbal. Mm-hmm. So like a ricola <laughs> cough drop, only not that complex, but <laughs> but herbal rather than citrusy. Right. Though there is some citrus notes mm-hmm. in it mm-hmm. um i almost want to say i get almost a little black pepper huh. tiny bit mm-hmm. um not as bright a, a flavor profile right right yeah i'd go with it it's calmer than than number one now that these have warmed up a bit they were pretty cold before and so they were very similar uh, a lot more similar before. Now that they're warming up, they they're opening up a bit more. Um, but yeah, number one was just like uh, reminding me of a 1970s, you know, style <laughs> tropical fruit salad. You know, oh, with yeah. lots of uh, you know wedges of uh, citrus fruits. Uh, number two is more of a, like I say, is almost like a grassy, tiny, just just edging onto oniony to me Mm -hmm. but i could see where you say herbal and spicy and things like that but still uh, delicious still tasty um Mm. you're you're swirling around and sniffing on the number two well and (laughs) and and i was pulling a lot of that that kind of savoriness out of the beer i i think it does go to onion see onion's the wrong word but but it's the right word but onion Will make you think that oh that doesn't taste good that's mm-hmm. that's wrong. It's so so light that it's that it tastes good. Just yeah, I mean think about it when you're mowing the grass and you hit just a little bit of wild onion in your yard and you smell that just like mm-hmm. ooh, just teeny bit of onion smell with your with with the grass clippings. 
Yeah, that works. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> it's really hard. You know, again, the beers are so similar that it, that it's it's hard to to put a lot of descriptors with them, mm-hmm. other than tastes good to me. Yeah, yeah. And my son Drew, you know, he's twenty one. He he hasn't he hasn't had a whole lot of beers. Uh, which is good. I'm, I'm encouraging him to moderate and take his time. There are plenty, plenty of time to drink all the beers in the world. But, you know, you could tell on the video he was, you know, trying to play along with his dad's fancy descriptors of all these beers. But, you know, he, he w- was mainly saying, yeah, this, this one tastes more. <laughs> <laughs> which is fine. It's a good place to start. So shall we talk about Amarillo? Yeah, let's do. So Amarillo... Um, Amarillo hops are, sorry, I was kind of thinking here. Amarillo hops are used worldwide where it's ultra high myrcene. Mm-hmm. Uh, myrcene content creates a delicious orange citrus flavor, which I can attest to. That's true. It really pulls that orange. A varietal of Virgil Gamache Farms, Inc. Amarillo is highly acidic, making it a perfect choice for ESBs, that's extra special bitters, and pale ales. Hmm. I wouldn't have thought about it for an ESB. Wouldn't have either, but yeah, it kind of makes sense. <clears throat> I always think of the big, well, Emerald is just, it just has big flavors. Mm-hmm. It's like, like the Texas Panhandle. <laughs> it's just big. <laughs> You know, there's a 72 ounce steak in Amarillo. <laughs> <laughs> you got to eat the potato with it, though. Yeah, yeah, and a salad. <laughs> Now, Amarillo, uh, I remember when Amarillo first came out, and we were just like head over heels in love with it. We couldn't right. get enough of the Amarillo, uh, and it was. It was delicious, and we we brewed a lot of beers, a lot of pale ales with uh, Amarillo. Yeah. Um, we've since, I've, maybe maybe I used it too much, but I haven't, I haven't uh, brewed a lot with Amarillo lately. I haven't either. I, I do use it. Um, and a fair number of the kits that I put together, mm. so recipes that I've had, and maybe that's because you know I do have some experience with it, and I know what it's, how it's going to perform. Uh, but I'm like you; I haven't brewed personally with it that much lately. I, you know, hops are kind of like watches; you know, they're bright and shiny, and they come along, and <laughs> then one day you see a new watch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, there are so many hops out there. Um, but then again, I've been, you know, I've been going back to Cascade a lot, you know, just because it's an old standby and you kind of know what you're going to get and it's all, it's delicious every time. And yeah, so maybe it's time to revisit Amarillo and, and, um, uh, it is a, it is a tasty hop. It's proprietary. So, you know, you can only get it by those licensed to, you know, you can't share, uh, rhizomes of Amarillo and have it in your yard, right. you know, so there is, there is something to be said about that though. Yeah. So, uh, on to beer number three. Beer number three. Oh, man. That is a, that's a lighter citrus flavor. That's, mm-hmm. I get more lemon with that. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I'd go with lemon. I don't, get, um, I don't get a big grapefruit bomb out of that. Mm. I would say that with all three of these, I don't get, I don't get pine no. anywhere. Mm-mm. And so that's probably good. I mean, just just meaning that they're not supposed to have any pine in them. I, mm-hmm. It just hit me that none of these go to that kind of Chinook place. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I wow. get I get lemon and orange. Mm-hmm. So if you think of the lifesavers, if you put a lemon one and a, an orange one in your mouth at the same time, that's kind of, kind of what this is like. I also get kind of a, well, but this is from the malt, though. I, there's a breadiness in this beer that I don't mm. get as much in the other two beers. And so I'm going to attribute that to the hops, though, yeah. since the since clearly they're the, they're the exact same beer. But there is a little bit more of a malty complexity to this beer to me. So I don't know which hop would cause that to happen. Mm. But I do get a little bit, and maybe not, maybe not the hops, but but that's one of the things that I detect different in this beer from the other two, mm. which isn't necessarily a hop flavor. It's more of a malt flavor. Boy, i got to say again how tasty all three of these beers are. Yeah. They're very good. 
and 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 how absolutely close together they are. Right? Mm-hmm. I mean, they they are different. You can definitely tell that th- those are different hops in there. But um, as I was saying earlier, before we started taping, I think sometimes we get as home brewers, uh, we get so concerned about using the exact hop that either a printed recipe that we got somewhere called for or that we've brewed previously ourselves. And th- at least this experiment or this this uh, sensory panel, I'm really struck at how different these hops really ought to be from one another, but how so much more similar they are than different. Mm-hmm. And uh, what I take away from that is that as a wise man once said, don't worry, relax, have a homebrew. Yeah, and maybe you just pick uh, hops that are in the same family and try to shoot for the, the same similar bitterness level by applying the right. same alpha acid percentage yeah. in your formulas wherever. Yeah. Shall we talk about Falconer's Flight? Yes, let's do. First of all, I love the name. <laughs> and um, the flight, of course, we were talking about how... The, that came up with it. This is a a, a meritage. It's a blend of hops. Mm-hmm. So then I thought, oh, a flight, a flight of beers. Mm. Okay. So um, Falconer's Flight is a proprietary blend of, blend of Pacific Northwest hops. These include uh, seven C, the seven C hops, Cascade, Centennial, Chinook, Citra, Cluster, Columbus, and Crystal. Mm. In addition to experimental varieties developed by Hop Union Limited. Uh, launched in 2010, it is considered a dual-purpose blend, particularly particularly suited to IPAs, but also pale ales and lagers. That would make sense. Falconer's Flight is listed as having distinct tropical, floral, lemon, and grapefruit attributes. Hmm. The blend was named in honor of Glenn Hay Falconer, a popular and up-and-coming American professional brewer who passed away in 2002. Hmm. Also Falconer's Flight. There you go. Well, well, it's uh, hmm. So have you uh, have you formed any opinions? I have, but I haven't any confidence in them. <laughs> um, I will tell you that I expected Willamette to be um, kind of uh, kind of a one note hmm. flavor. I kind of expected it to be a little grassy, a little herbal, and that was it. Mm. Uh, um, I wasn't expecting a lot of juicy fruitiness out of it, but all three of these beers are kind of juicy and fruity. So mm-hmm. so I'm kind of stumped there. So what I thought I might be able to pick out, I'm not going to be able to. Um, and then I would also say that all of them have quite complex flavor profiles. So I don't have a clue. And, and and I'm like you in that, at least back in the day, we used to brew with Amarillo a bunch. And I thought, well, I'll pick out the Amarillo. But honestly, from these three, I can't. Now, having said that, I do have I do have my opinions. So I'll share them when it's, your t- when it's my time. Well, do you want to go first or do you want me to go? Or do you want to let, take turns? Let you go first on number one. Okay. Um, I have to revisit. One sec. <laughs> I'm about out here. I'm going to go with... Mm. Oh, boy, this is tough. Yeah, it's hard. Well, I'm going to go with number one as Willamette. Oh, interesting. I I thought number one would be Amarillo. I think number, I think number two is Willamette. What do you think number two? See, I think number two is Falconer's Flight. <laughs> Be- oh. because to my palate both when it was cold right when we first opened them and even now that it's warmed i think it just has it's very complex ah. so i'm basing that on it being a hop hash with a lot of different hop, different kinds of hops in it totally wrong i mean i haven't got a clue but but that's my that's my story and i'm sticking to it see i thought number three being lemony and orangey and it seemed like more complex in the citrusy part i thought number three would be falconer's flight i could so can you can can we remember what we 
<laughs> I've got uh, Willamette, Falconer's Flight, Amarillo in that order. I've got Amarillo, Willamette, and Falconer's Flight. So all oh, three right. of ours are different. Well, this will be interesting. It'd be hard now, for us to get all three of them, both of us to get all three of them wrong. But that's <laughs> true. Let's see if we can do it. Well, and again, <laughs> I, I really this this might be the hardest challenge yet, mm. even though I haven't been particularly accurate yet. But <laughs> but they really are very very similar beers, and I don't Amarillo. Ah, I got number one right. Yeah, you did. So okay, <clears throat> number okay number two. Drum roll. That's stuck on there. Boy, no kidding. Number two is Falconer's Falcon Flight. Flight. So oh, I got so you got right. number two right, and that means this has to be Willamette. Yeah, which means neither of us got no. Well, we each got one right. We each got one right. Huh? Interesting. Wow. Yeah, Willamette. Wow. Wow. <laughs> huh. Well, so Willamette is much more complex than I thought it was, even though I got mm-hmm. the wrong one. Um, huh. I always think of Willamette as being kind of a sidekick hop to Cascade. That's how I use it. It's like mm. Cascade and Willamette. They're perfect mm. together, which they are. But boy, I'm really encouraged to use Willamette all on its lonesome. Yeah. You know, I'm really impressed with all three of these quite a bit. Yeah. Boy, that's a surprise. Yeah, Willamette was... Um, hmm. it, it was a lot more interesting in this tasting than it was in the video tasting. Huh. It In the video tasting, it was kind of like muted sort of mm-hmm. compared to the amarillo and like i say kind of more it it was kind of juicy and tropical fruity but then it also had you know like i say that that kind of um old world hop flavor of that spice and mm-hmm. and I, I don't get it in this sample mm, i don't either mm. busy drinking mm. Mm. that's tasty so which is your favorite Boy, I don't really have a favorite of the three. Huh. Um, but if you make me choose, I'd probably say the number two, the Falconer's Flight. Huh. I think I'd, I'd go with number one, Amarillo. Yeah, there you go. Um, but if you poured me all three of these beers on a windy day, I, pr- I really probably couldn't tell them apart. Yeah. Um, especially you know, cold. Especially cold and distracted by a ball game or something. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That was fun. That was great. And I, and, I, and this and this bolsters my confidence in the hop stand bittering unit uh, theory when you're trying to e- equal the bitterness between batches, mm-hmm. uh, and especially when you benchmark it in, in your own uh, brewing practices. Yep. Um, great experiment. <sighs> I don't even know where to go with this. It's just it, it's really nice. Um, I'm really impressed with all of these. Um, I have to say that we, at my store, we sell, I probably sell more Amarillo than the other two. Willamette, I think, gets kind of forgotten. Mm-hmm. And Falconer's Flight just isn't known about. You know, people don't, they're not familiar with it, so they don't try it. Mm-hmm. But based on what we just did here tonight, man, I'd, I'd willingly brew with any one of these three at any time. Yeah. Really nice. All right. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, James. Well, thanks again to Steve of Steve's Brew Shop. This continues to be a very fun series to take part in. I hope you're enjoying it as much as we are. I've learned a lot. Just got to write it down somewhere so I can remember what I've learned. (laughs) I haven't picked out the hops for the next round, uh, but uh, I am looking forward to it, though. In the meantime, if you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to james at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from. Thanks to everybody supporting us through our Patreon page. Special goodies coming your way. Check that out at patreon.com slash basicbrewing. Be sure to check out our DVDs, Extract Brewing and Partial Mashing, Stepping into All Grain, Low Tech Lagering and Decoction Mashing, and Introduction to Wine Kits. You can find them all on our site. Get a free Basic Brewing bottle opener with any DVD combo, and you can check out our Basic Brewing shirts in the store, too. You can find our log books, where you can track and log up to 50 batches of beer. Check all that out at basicbrewingshop.com. It's all until, that, uh, it's all until next time. Until then, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer. Production help for Basic Brewing Radio and our website is provided by Callie Dotson. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time, everybody. So long.